Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Sarah Abosh Jacobson. I'm the Barbara Rabin Chief Education Officer here at the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. And I'd like to thank you for joining us for our 2023 Spring Break Survivor Speaker Series. And this today is the first in the series. You will be hearing from Mr. Bert Romberg, who will share his experience growing up in Germany during the Nazi rise to power and his escape to England on the Kinder Transport, a rescue mission that allowed thousands of Jewish children from Germany, Austria, and Czechoslovakia to live with private English citizens. Before we begin, I would like to ask all of you to please turn the ringers off on your cell phones. Um, and that means adults too. <laughs> okay. Um, so I would also like to thank our community partners for the Spring Sur Break Survivor Series, including Congregation Sharif Israel, Dallas Institute of Humanities and Culture, Green Hill School, Hope Supply Company, Jewish Federation of Greater Dallas Jewish Community Relations Council, Refugee Services of Texas, Southwest Jewish Congress, Temple Shalom, Texas Holocaust Genocide and Anti-Semitism Advisory Commission. We are extremely grateful for your support of the museum and our programs. I would also like to extend a special welcome to our board members, members and volunteers in the audience. We couldn't fulfill our mission without you. If you are interested in becoming a museum member or volunteer, please visit our website at dhhrm.org to learn more. In just a moment, Bert will share his story with you. Then we will have time for questions and answers. If you are joining us in person today, you received a card on your way into the theater and you can use that uh, to write uh, any questions that you might have down on and we will send staff around to collect those at the end of Bert's talk. If you are joining us virtually, please use the Q&A button or function at the bottom of your screen to type out and submit your questions. It is now my very great pleasure to turn things over to Mr. Bert Romberg. Good afternoon. Let me set up first. Okay. It's a wonderful audience. I'm amazed how many of you are here. I'm going to spend 45, 50 minutes with you. I'm going to try to tell you the story of mine and my sister's first 15, 16 years on this planet. I may skip a lot, but you'll learn something. We're talking about events that happened in the first half of the 20th century. 1900 to 1950, roughly. We're now in the 21st century. So we're going back 70, 80, 90 years. And my sister and I come from a place called Ostheim. You will see up behind me a crude map that we've constructed, or that the museum constructed. The blue line is roughly the journey we took from our home in Ostheim, the town on the map on the bottom right, it's really, at that time, it, it was really no more than a village, possibly 100, 150 families. We had a rather good life there. Maggie was born in 1929. I was born there in 1930. Well, if you can do the math, you'll know how old we are. We are now among a very small group of what's called survivors. We actually weren't survivors in the sense that people generally think about survivors, people who survived severe uh, physical punishment during the first, during the Second World War. Um, they came out of there with mental and physical scars many of them with tattoos. We didn't go through that experience. We weren't 
in a concentration camp. We escaped these terrible events in Europe just before they began. So we go to <clears throat> 19, the early 1920s in Germany and in the rest of the world there was severe depression, economic hardship, people, families unable to feed their kids, very dis discontented populations. And in Germany in particular, there was additional hardship because the Germans had, quote, lost the First World War. I don't think anybody wins a war. It's just that the Germans lost more than the, quote, other countries who call themselves the victors. And the victors imposed on Germany reparations penalties, which in addition to the general uh, economic problems made Germany that much worse. And in this period of hardship and a discontented population, along comes a party, a political party, headed by a very charismatic speaker and leader uh, called Adolf Hitler, who promised to bring that population out of its misery, out of its poverty, and make Germany great again. I'm spending time with this because some of what you're hearing from me now of problems that arose in Germany in that time has some parallels with what's going on in the world today. So <clears throat> Adolf Hitler in the early 1920s formed this party that by the time a democratic election in 1932, by then that party was strong enough to bring him to power and to make him the leader of the German National Socialist Party, abbreviated to Nazi Party, and he took charge as chancellor of the German parliament, which is the equivalent of the president of the United States, but he didn't, he didn't continue a, a, a democratic administration. He made it a tyrannical, uh, personal administration. And with it, a very few weeks, months, he started to begin a uh, political program looking for victims to blame for Germany's ills. As many dictators do, they look for somebody or some group to, to concentrate their hatred and divert their population's attention from their real problems. In any event, one of the groups that Hitler and his Nazi party concentrated on for punishment, unreasonable punishment for Germany's ills, was the German Jewish population. Germany's Jewish citizens some 400, 450,000, less than 1% of the population began to suffer a, a politically inspired demonization, dehumanization, to the point where in the next 15 or 12 years, 1933, when the party came to power, 1945, when they lost the Second World War and lost power, those 
their uh, instigation cost in Europe alone some 50 million lives, of which only 6 million were Jewish lives. But that 6 million died as a result of actual persecution. They were not involved in any war. They were not involved in any political party. They were innocent citizens. But because they were Jewish, and because this party had to find somebody to blame, they were the targets, and they were exterminated. Six million lives. And for you children in the, in the audience, I'm going to give you a math problem, because most of you by now have had enough math to know what a fraction is. Of those six million, million and a half, 1.5000000 were children, 15 years and younger. And my story and Maggie's story, the kinder transport rescued and brought 10,000 children out of this potential danger just ahead of it. So 10,000 of us survived, and a million and a half in a period of six years were killed. If you do the math, with 10,000 in the numerator, million and a half in the denominator, and you rationalize that fraction, you'll find out it means one over 150. And it means that for every child that was rescued by the kinder transports, 150 children died in the next 15 years, in the next six years. So here's our particular story. We lived in our time. We, I'm talking about our family, the Rombergs, and another family of the Strausses, two Jewish families in this little place in 1933. My mother and my father, they married when they were quite, for that age, for that time, quite old already. So they had their children in a hurry. They were married in 1927. This is, well, that 29 has to be corrected. It's actually 1927. This is the picture of their marriage. And it's in our backyard in Germany. And the people there, there were about 30 people at that wedding. These are just the close relatives. Of those people that you see there, only six or seven survived the next 13 years. And the little guy that's in the bottom there is a cousin who actually comes up later in this story. So in 1927, they were married. 1929 and 1930, they had their, their two children. And this is their marriage certificate. This is a Jewish marriage certificate. The picture on the right is the actual, it's called a ketubah. It's the Hebrew word for contract. And it's a contract between the people who are at this wedding, the bride, the groom, their close relatives, and a witness. And it spells out their responsibilities for the rest of that partnership, the bride and the groom. The picture on the right is its modern version. You can get this on the, you can get this for 10 bucks on the web. And if you want to know how to use it, be in touch with us. We'll show you how. Okay. 
this was us time. The pictures on the top left are uh, probably more recent, but the picture on the bottom right is the actual house on the bottom right, and you'll see here in the in the gables of that house is the reason we I'm showing it to you is because you'll see the initials B R and those are my grandfather's initials. He built this house in nineteen ten. Do you see that? And the and the actually he built this house before nineteen ten because in German at the bottom it says Greetings from us time. This postcard from 1910 shows the old main street with Silchen House. In parentheses, Silchen House is a translation roughly General Store. General Store Rothschild Romberg. Rothschild is my mother's maiden name. And later, it was a drugstore, Greenwald, and today Werner Schernick and Anna Schernick own that house. The Schernicks are the family who lived right next to us when we had to flee, when my mother decided it was no longer tolerable for, for us to live there. The Schernicks bought that house. The house still stands. And my children and we have actually visited with the Sherniks and have been in touch with their children who are our age. Uh, I think the last time we spoke to them on the phone about six months ago. In any event, the reason for our leaving. 1933, Nazi party takes over. Very quickly, two regulations important regulations as they affected our little family. One, it's not good, morally correct, for you good German citizens to do business with Jews. And if you have to do business with them, better not to pay them very much, better still not pay them at all, and we, the government, which is now the Nazi party, will see to it that no policeman, no prosecutor, no civil or criminal authority, no judge, no jury, will take a Jew's uh, side in a dispute with you. So right there, we lost our civil liberties, and we lost the ability to run a business. That was 1933. Right thereafter, the second, uh, the second regulation, it said, it's much simpler than the first one, it said no Jewish child will attend a public school. And then in 1934, a year after this, we lost my daddy. He died. And my mother was stuck with two little smart-nosed infants, responsible for trying to maintain the business, and two little infants, and having to take care of her then widowed mother and she herself was a widow. And more and more of these regulations and some additional thereafter made it impossible to stay here because there was no, no authority. It wasn't a Jewish population they could live among. And the villagers, although many of them were her very good friends, they were terrorized by the Nazi party to do anything to help us. So in 1936, she left. And you'll see from that map 
the next town, just north of there, Eschwege, it's probably about 60 miles, 100 kilometers, where her, my aunt, my mother's next older sister, lived. And it's a rather larger town, maybe 28, 25,000 people, which had its own Jewish population big enough to have their own school. And her older sister lived there so that she had some company, some help to take care of us and, and to get us some, she had a chance to look forward to some schooling for her children, Maggie, my sister Maggie, and for me. And she was right in the sense that it was a bigger, a little more cosmopolitan city. And we lived fairly well for a year and a half, two years. Uh, this is what we looked like. You'll see the kids at the bottom. We were probably there three or four, and Maggie was five. And the next, the larger picture was probably when we were six or seven or eight. And we went to school there in the, in the Jewish school. And for a couple of years, we lived reasonably well. We lived in this apartment house. That's our mother. That's my sister and I. You see this little guy with a nice cravat, has his hair cut probably has his ears cleaned for the first time in months. And there's that big collared white shirt. This was probably my first day in school. It's a typical uniform for a German Jewish child, first day in school. And I think in Israel, I went into kindergarten and Maggie probably first grade. And my mother, in addition to having a little money from selling that property, began to take in sewing for other people, and we lived reasonably well. Our grandmother came with us and lived in this apartment house. 1936, we moved there, 37, we went to school there, 38. It became very, very difficult. Nazi party got its hands on the German on the, on the Eschwege civil administration and began to make things worse for us. And Maggie remembers clearer than I that we would go to school and we would be accosted and bullied by the neighborhood kids who should have been our friends by that time. And our lunch pails were stolen, our books were thrown in the gutter and we'd come home crying, but there was nothing to be done about it. Probably the policeman on the corner egged these kids on. In any event, we were literally defenseless, legally and criminally and civilly. We had no rights at all by that time anymore. And then at the end of 1938, a government-inspired, a Nazi party and government-inspired uh, terrible event called Kristallnacht. It happened uh, at the end of 1938. In 36 hours, two days and one night, or one day, one night, the next day, a program of plundering of pillaging, of destroying Jewish property, Jewish businesses, Jewish apartments, Jewish homes. And it's called Kristallnacht because of two, a German has, the German language combines words, so one big word made up of two or three other words. It's very descriptive. Kristall is crystal glass, crinkling, and Nacht is the word for night, Kristallnacht, so it's the night of broken glass. And everything in every street in that town had some destroyed 
Jewish facility. But the worst part of that 36 hours was Jewish men, 18 years and older, were kidnapped and taken to the first of the concentration camps. And the world heard for the first time names like Dachau, Buchenwald, Groß Rosen, in German, actually beautiful names for terrible places. Places where inmates or concentration camp uh, prisoners were mistreated, maltreated, uh, beaten, broken, starved. And many men came out of there physically debilitated, mentally damaged. And they were in there for anywhere from a few weeks to several months. My uncle, I can remember, came out of there 30 pounds lighter and determined to flee. And so did all the rest. And it, ter it horrified the world. It terrified the German Jewish population. And we, among many, lined up at any consulate that would give us a hearing to get a visa to leave. Unfortunately, most countries didn't want us. It was a time similar to what you have here, where there were refugees needing to flee, needing to get out of harm's way. But most countries said, we got our own problems. We're in a depression, we're in a recession. If we take refugees in, they're going to steal our jobs. <clears throat> it's a story we hear today. We don't need refugees. We don't want refugees. And anyway, they're different. I'm telling you this because it's a moral story that needs reminding. In any event, in that short period of time, end of 1938 into 1939, a, 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 a religious sect in England, the Quakers, a Christian sect, a small population, heard about what's going on in Germany and heard about what's going on, what's happening to the Jewish population. And they said, this is terrible. We ought to find out what's really going on. And they sent a small delegation of five or six people to Germany. They weren't there very long. They came back within a couple of weeks and told their congregations, it's worse than we're hearing on our radios. There was no television then worse than we're seeing in our newspapers. And we should do something. And they got together with some Jewish relief groups and they implored Parliament, British Parliament, to let refugees come in. And Parliament said, no way. Britain, if you will know from your history, was the first of the major trade union nations. And the politicians were just totally afraid that if they let refugees in, the next election, they were out. But the Quakers persisted. They had some help from one or two members of parliament. And eventually they struck a bargain with Parliament. Parliament said, we can't afford to let these people in. We don't have the budget. The Quakers and their allies said, if you let them in, we'll pay for them. And they came out with a bargain allowing about 10,000 Jewish children, children, 15 years and younger, who won't take anybody's jobs. And they guaranteed the British government 
that any child that they brought in, free of any visa, free of any restrictions, they would see to it that those children would be housed, would be fed, would be clothed, and would be schooled without any cost to the British Treasury. And then in very short order, because they knew they would get some relief, the Quakers managed to deal with German railway, Deutsche, Deutsche Bahn, and stationed and locate trains at four cities, Berlin, the capital, Frankfurt, the number two city. Let me show you where that might be. Well, anyway. Oh. And then Prague, the capital of Czechoslovakia, a neighboring country that had been partially overrun by the Germans already. And Vienna, the capital of Austria. And Austria had annexed itself to Germany and had its own Nazi party, more vicious than the Germans. But those were two large cities with fairly large Jewish population. And trains leaving those stations went through on this blue map, on this blue line, Hook of Holland, which is the ferry terminal for ferries to go from the continent to England and then eventually to London, and we got on those trains. Our mother heard about it, but coincidentally, a very fortunate event for her and for us that actually permitted her to make this decision. In the, in the wedding picture that you saw, there was a cousin who went to England early in, in 1932 or 1933, took a little money, established himself in business. And by 1938, 39, had made enough money to get a lawyer or whatever, and he managed to get a visa for my mother. I don't, I have a picture of it here, I'll t tell you about it later, but anyway, it permitted her to go to England with us. She jumped on that train and acted as a chaperone. And she was allowed to stay there because she had a visa. There were other grown-ups that went with these children. My sister remembers these, these rail cars, passenger cars, full of kids, one or two adults. But they had to come back. Firstly, they didn't have a visa. The British didn't want them in. And the Germans probably said, you better come back because we have the rest of your family here. But mother was allowed to stay there. But the condition of her visa clearly said, you, Mrs. Romberg, if you come to England, you won't take a job other than as a... a uh, helper in a household, which meant that she had to be a, a live-in maid, and knowing that she couldn't, probably couldn't find a household that would put up with two little kids, put us in the kinder transport, who would take care of our upkeep somehow. So if you look at this map, she quickly got a job Time-wise, by the time the kinder transport was organized at the end of 1938, beginning of 1939, till the Second World War broke out, August, September 1939, in that seven, eight months period, 10,000 children, of which Maggie and I were two, managed to get to England with one or two chaperones, my mother one of them. And we went to London first. I can remember quite clearly arriving in London, and they put us up in some large hall with cots, and adults were around, you know, taking us to the bathroom, getting us a meal, etc., etc. 
and we stayed there for a short period of time. And they found families in England to take care of us. My mother immediately got a job with a wealthy family in North London. And then for the next several months, we didn't see, basically didn't see her, but we were sent to Coventry, that town in the middle of England. It was a major industrial town. Coventry was the Detroit of England. English motor cars were made there. And when the war broke out, it became a major um, war goods manufacturing center. Instead of cars, they made tanks or, or whatever it took, uh, trucks and armaments, etc., etc. So we were there for, I was there for the next three years. Sister was there for four, four and a half years. And we were settled, we were uh, fostered by families. Maggie got fostered by a Jewish family uh, who had two kids older than she, and they didn't treat her very well. She got there when she was just turning 10. And by the time she was 11 and a half, they'd, she'd become their housemaid, doing their laundry, cleaning their bathrooms, you name it. I was taken in by a family called Shepherd, a non-Jewish family, Christian family, uh, working class people. Uh, the, the man of the house was a, a postman or letter carrier. And the lady was a uh, part-time barmaid in the in the pub down the street, and they also had two children. Peter was a couple of years older than I. He probably was ten or eleven, and Mary was another couple of years older than he. She was probably thirteen at the time, and they embraced me. They they were just totally devoted to my becoming as English as they could make me. And they shared their what meager rations with me. And it was a wonderful time for me. They even gave me piano lessons. And that turned to be, a, probably turned out to be their biggest mistake. <laughs> anyway, I, I was happy there. Uh, Maggie lived not so far away from from me in, in, in that town, a few blocks, but I didn't see much of her. And anyway, we got there at, at the in June 1939, and two months later, World War II broke out, so there was no more uh, communications with the continent, but we did okay. Maggie, as, as poorly as she was treated in, in the big scheme of things, she did all right by doing all right. I mean, compared to the 150 kids that never made it, she did. And she's still alive. Uh, she has two wonderful grandsons. She, has, she got her first great-grandchild two months ago. So that's it. That's what the Quakers did, because they saw to it that at least she got housed, schooled, fed, and clothed, and here she is today. And she gives these kind of speeches here. She's been at it much longer than I. She's probably been doing this 20 years, 25 years. I only have 10 years of practice. You'll excuse me for that. What you're seeing on the screen, let me show you. That green or yellow parchment on top is the word up meldon. It's two words again. The word up in German is away or gone, and meldon is notice. So it's a notice of departure. 
and it is dated February 1939. No, it's March 1939. And what it says, it's a permission to travel. By this time, the Nazis had gotten such a hold on German society that you needed a travel certificate just to go from, say, here to the Waxahachie. And it's signed in the bottom, the, the bottom two lines, it's signed by the mayor and by the police chief. And on top of that, it's signed by my mother, Sida Sarah Romberg. Now let me tell you what that means. The Nazis had the gall, and the German word, or the Jewish word, is chutzpah, to tell its Jewish citizens that you have to have Jewish names. And if you're a female, if you're a youngster, six years old, or you're Aunt Judy, and you're somebody's grandma, if you're a female, your name is now Sarah. Because that's a biblical Jewish name, and you don't have your first name anymore. And if you're a male, and you've got a little brother, and you are his daddy, and your brother is a plumber next door, and your grandfather is already retired, all you guys are now called Israel. And you don't have your first name anymore. Imagine that. They may call you Izzy, but they don't call you Bird anymore. They don't call you George. Okay? And it says that. It, it says, Sita Sarah Romberg, and she has to sign Sarah. And down below, up where it says Berthold, Israel, that's my name. And in addition, it's signed by the mayor, which testifies that she's been a good citizen. And it's signed by the police chief, which testifies that she is not a criminal. And it shows when she was born and where she was born, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's what they were doing to us. And because of that, more and more, they made into us what they call untermenschen. Unter means down below. Mention is a word for population, for people. So it means lower people. Okay. They did this before the war broke out, they, but they were in power. And then when the war broke out, and you'll see that map, which is the red part is Germany, and all around our other countries. They did this. When the war broke out, they transported that philosophy into all those countries around there and forced that regime on eight million Jewish people who lived all around there. And of that eight million, Six were murdered in the next six years. So, we have a little more time. Here we go. This is pictures of the kinder transport. That picture on the bottom left, those two little children, that's probably what Maggie and I look like, but that's not us. And then above there is a rail station. I'm pretty sure it's the hook of Holland where the kids are being taken from the rail from the railway station on one side and the boat dock on the other side. And the picture on the right 
his arrival in England, and we know that because this big guy with a funny hat is a British policeman. So then we were in Coventry, and the war broke out. And Coventry was the first town, because it's a heavy armaments producer, that the Germans concentrated on in, in the Blitz, which is carpet bombing of industrial facilities. And the picture above on the top left is a typical street after the bombing. The houses are still smoldering. They've cleared the streets a little bit, and people are moving around, and down below is a family sitting in front of their ruined house. And what you see there, that certificate you see on the top, it's dated 1941. It's actually time-stamped, July 1942. And it's addressed to my mother, who, in the house that she was a servant, that house was destroyed in the Blitz. And she lost all her goods. And the British government, in the War Damage Act, said for private, the private chattels stream. Do you know what chattels are? Chattels are personal property. It's a very common name in those days and even today. But it says, in effect, um, that the British government acknowledges you lost all these goods because of the bombing in Basing Hill, which is the street where she was uh, housemaid. And we estimate that you lost goods valued at 54 pounds, 17 shillings, and sixpence. And we gave you an advance already of nine pounds, 10. So we still owe you 45 pounds, seven shillings and sixpence. This was July 42, where we had been there already two and a half, three years. And she had not been permitted to work in anything but a household. But that 45 pounds probably amounted at the time to several months of payment. And it did one thing, it did two things for her. She got some freedom of motion. And she was able to buy a rail ticket to see her little boy. And then, because the British realized that they had quite a few of these refugees who they were not permitting to work, and their regular workforce was in the army or in the navy, and she was allowed to find regular employment. And she became a sewing machine operator in a uh, factory making uniforms. And it was the first time she made a decent salary. So that 45 pounds was like emancipation day for her. Okay. Some more. For those of you kids who have ESL, you're in school, you have kids who are from other countries, and our school system teaches English because you have a second language, or English is your second language. Well, that didn't happen to us. We landed in English schools, and if we didn't learn in a hurry, we got left in the dust. Well, we learned in a hurry. And within a very few weeks, Maggie and I were speaking perfect English. And that note that you see there is a letter that Maggie wrote to our uncle. And by that time, she, we had a family living in New York where my mother's oldest sister and, and brother-in-law and their children. And if you know your history, America didn't enter the war till 1941, December 7, 
By that time, the British had been at war with Germany two and a half years and were literally starving. Britain is an island. It was surrounded by oceans. The Germans sent their U-boats, submarines out to destroy the convoys that were bringing food to Britain, and we were severely rationed. But there still was commerce between America and England because America wasn't in the war and the U-boats didn't chase American ships. And Maggie is thanking our aunt and uncle for sending some goodies. And she has a temerity to ask for some more. Thank you for the chocolates. But it's a perfect English letter and it's better than she writes today. Okay? Here's a sorry little document. We left, and many people who got out of Germany ahead of time left family in Europe. My grandma, and an uncle, cousins. And the British Red Cross, you see that Red Cross there? came out with a certificate, which is, this is one side, this is the back side, which said, we have been able to contact German Red Cross, and you see in black, Deutsches Rotes Kreuz, and it's dated July 1942. And it says, Mrs. Romberg, or whoever gets one of these, if you will write a few words and give us the address of your next of kin, or at least the last known address. German Red Cross has, has uh, agreed to try to find these people, and they can write something on the back and send it to us, and you'll at least know where they are and how they're doing. This was 1942. Mother filled it out in German. It says, Dear Mama, Paula, her sister, Margot, which is my cousin. Hope you are healthy. Gretel, which is my sister's nickname. Gretel and Bertie, which is my name, are with me and uh, um, are with us, and it goes well with us. Children go to school, and I'm working, and it says, kisses, see down. And she dates it 8 June 1942. And it's dated in Germany, July 1942. And she gives my grandmother's name in Frankfurt, where we left her in a senior citizen's home when we had to leave. And it comes back, and we don't have a date. I mean, there's a date, but I can't identify it. But it comes back in this very hefty, stylized German script. I've had to have a, a, a university professor help me to translate it because I couldn't properly write, uh, read its writing. And it says, um, it, uh, I am healthy and, and Paula, Paula her my mother's, my grandmother's second daughter and my aunt uh, are also okay um, and we are doing well and she signs it Muta and we never call her Muta we always call her Oma or Mama so we suspect A because of this serious script and because of the signature, that this was written for her. Because by this time, we know that she was interred in a concentration camp. And we know she died five months later. So here, we're now in 1943. And... Excuse me, I've developed hay fever, I think. I need to blow my nose. 
Right? It's coming on to, to my bar mitzvah. Most of you will know what a bar mitzvah is. If not, I'll explain it to you later. But it's a, it's a time in a Jewish family's life when the child, as he, he or she approaches 13, learns for his or her bar in, in the girl's case, it will be bat mitzvot. It's the time when the child is eligible to become or to join the adult congregation. To do that, we have to learn in Hebrew large sections of the Hebrew Bible. It requires some study. It requires a Hebrew teacher, etc., etc., etc. I'm living in Coventry, severely bombed, and the synagogue is destroyed, and the rabbi and the Hebrew school teacher are probably in the army, and mother realizes that I'm coming up on my bar mitzvah, and where and how am I going to learn to do that? And she appeals to the refugee society to find a place where I can learn from my bar mitzvah. And they find a place in, on this map, if we go back, in, in Hartford, a town just above London, 30 some odd miles out of London, where there is the Jewish orphanage. It's a prestigious small orphanage from London evacuated to Hartford, which is a rural town. The reason for the evacuation is to get kids out of London, which was being also carpet blitzed and destroyed. By the way, the blitz is a bombing mission. It's not a football term. Okay, so that by then this orphanage of maybe a hundred kids is farmed out to Coventry where they don't have their own dormitory and we are again, or those kids, and I'm now one of them, fostered out on a local family and I landed with another wonderful family the Pettits, who were a younger couple, and I became their first child's babysitter. By then I was 12, he was a couple of months old, and they were working. So it was a very fortunate time-wise time for them and time for me. And I, I really had a, a wonderful set of foster parents. And I've been, they have, of course, have passed on since then, but I've been in touch with this boy who is now, of course, he's a man in his 70s now, but I was in touch with him, and we paid for both parents' headstones, and we visited, and my children have visited them and corresponded with them. Anyway... I had my bar mitzvah at the orphanage, and this list is a typical li list of presents that a kid of 13, when he has bar mitzvah, gets. And it is, the second item is an atlas from Auntie Erna. The fourth item is Mr. and Mrs. Bloom gave me 10 shillings, and Ms. Ms. Brenner gave me six shillings. And then somebody gave me a wristwatch. And somebody gave me a, a briefcase. And somebody gave me a pocket knife. All the things that a 13-year-old would want. And that's the list. <laughs> OK? So next. And then a fortunate thing happened to me. At the orphanage, which was a London school and controlled by the London County Council, a very rich county, 
but controlling the, the schooling of the kids in Hartford. And the London County Council had a system of scholarships called the 11s and the 15s. When a kid is 11 or 12 or 15 or 16, allowed to take a competitive exam. And if they pass, it is the first step to the English university system. Be aware, in those days, compulsory public schooling stopped at 14. On your 15th birthday, you're in the workforce. Okay? That happened to my sister. I got a scholarship when I was 12 and got admitted to Battersea Grammar School. And what you see on the left is something that's the equivalent of their yearbook. And where are some kids in the audience? Let's see. You over there. Yes, you. Do you have a school mascot? Who, what is it? It's a jaguar. Jaguar? Yeah. She is the mascot. <laughs> jaguar. Let's see what we had. You see this guy? That's St. John. You see what's on his... That's a phoenix. You got a jaguar? They got a phoenix. <laughs> this guy rises out of, the, out of the flames. Okay? Not only that, the school has a patron saint, St. John. You don't have a patron saint. <laughs> He's the guy that slew the dragon. See him? Down there? You should see him. And the kind of schooling we got. 13-year-old kid. We went to school 8.30 to 5.30, five and a half days a week. And even the half day it was considered a half a day. Instead of 5.30, we got out at 3.30. OK? And we learned at the same time. Do you want to take notes? Three math. Algebra, geometry, trig. Three English. Written, verbal, reading. Reading means you'll read the classics. Verbal means you'll become a debater. Written means you better have nice hands, handwriting and you better know how to spell. Okay? Three sciences. Bio, biochemistry, physics. Geography. Something like civics, citizenship. Okay? And in addition, it was wartime. So instead of the half-day athletics, we were on the farm picking potatoes and taking care of the crops because the normal workers were in the army. But the reason I'm telling you this, this early education was a bargain. It was the greatest thing that could have happened to me. Because when I came to America, 15 years old, middle of the sophomore year, I was light years ahead in all of these subjects. And that took care of me. The rest took care of my family the rest of our lives. So I'm telling you this, if somebody wants to teach you something, sit up, take notice, ask for more. Because it will not only be good for you, it will be good for whatever family you have, it will be good for all of you. And it will be good for your community. Okay? Try to remember that. 
So we're coming to the end of this story because we haven't much time. I'm in Coventry. Margaret is no longer. Margaret by that time is out of school and in London working. And Mama decides she's homesick for her, what family we have and applies and asks them to get a visa to America. And in April, I think it's April 1940, this was dated August 1944, telling her that the State Department has approved our visa and they're passing it on to the consulate in London to, to interview us and approve the visa. And then um, our uncle in Jamaica, New York, sends a telegram to my mother, visa application granted, embassy London informed through State Department, congratulations. Okay? And the British in the meantime, knowing that the Germans have taken away our citizenship, they figured out a certificate of identity that acts like a passport. And this is my mother's certificate of identity. And it's dated November 1944. And it has on the left side all the stops we made on the way to the New World. And we ended up leaving Wait a on this ship, the Aquitania, that's the Cunard, it's a British luxury liner that the Canadians had uh, rented from Britain to ferry their troops to the European theater of operations. And we got on this ship on its return to Canada. And you'll see here my landing card. And it's Bertolt Romberg. And I'm called Master, British. I'm Master Romberg. And I'm in whatever class they think it was. But anyway, that's my landing card. The one is my boarding card, the other is my landing card. And then this is what you have here, is my foster mother in Hartford. This is a letter from April 9th, 1977 some 22 years after we left her. And we were in touch with her for a long, long time. We visited with her later on. And here you have the cemetery in Ostheim where my grandfather and father are buried. And this is one of the few Jewish cemeteries that was not vandalized or destroyed by the Germans. And it was because Ostheim was such a, a small, little, meaningless village in this big scheme of things that I think they just didn't even know it was there. This is Maggie, sister and I today. And I thank you for your good attention. Thank you, Bert, and thank you all so much uh, for joining us today for this uh, survivor talk. Um, we have run out of time, so what I'm going to do is see if Mr. Romberg is willing to stay for a few minutes for those of you who might want to come up to ask him questions. Is that okay, Bert? Better yet. I hope you brought some sandwiches. <laughs> We're going to keep you. Okay. All right. Thank you all so very much. And please join us again tomorrow for another talk at this time. Okay. Oh, look at him. You're dismissing him? No questions?